Hi, this is Bob Sorrentino from Italian Roots and Genealogy, and I'm here today with Lou Del Bianco, uh, who wrote a fascinating story, Out of the Shadows of Mount Rushmore, about his grandfather, Luigi Del Bianco, who is actually, wait for it, the chief carver of Mount Rushmore, and you could see Luigi's work behind Lou. So thanks, Lou, for being here. Uh, thank you, Bob. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, and I want to get into the, about Rushmore in, in a little bit, but first, uh, you know, you're the first person that I know who's, um, or interviewed anyway, that family came from Friuli. And um, I'd like to talk a little bit about your, your roots going back there and how your grandfather actually came to America. Well, I'm actually, um, only a quarter of my family is from Friuli. Most of my family is from, I call it South Central Italy. <laughs> it's uh, it's called the Camino Valley. It's um, kind of like uh, south western part of Lazio. Uh, it's called Frosinone, and there's a little town called Rocaseca that my mother's family is from. And then my father's mother, Luigi's wife, was from Abruzzo. Towards a, and that's also in the Camino Valley. So three quarters of my heritage is is down in what I consider <laughs> south central Italy. But that quarter uh, is probably why I look the way I do. I'm about six foot four. And, uh, you know, they're from the uh, about 40 minutes um, from the border of Austria and Slovenia. And the people there are definitely taller. They are definitely, uh, some of them have a Slavic look to them. Sure. Yeah. Um, in fact, my uncle Caesar has a story of my grandfather taking him to a, called the Fame Frulan. Which they have their own language in that part of Italy. It's wild. And my uncle was like, Papa, these people don't look Italian. <laughs> he was like, of course they're Italian. What are you talking about? <laughs> well, and your uh, grandfather was, was a, a big man too. Yeah. Yeah. He was about six feet tall, which again, for, is me. tall for an Italian. Yeah. My mother's family, the, 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 they're, they're probably pretty typical of the immigrant experience. Um, I, my, I have an aunt that's still alive and she did share a story that I didn't know about my mother's parents. And in that, um, my grandfather, Giovanni Bruni, uh, came here in 1924. And I was surprised that he came in 24 because I believe that it was like a, 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 a um, uh, they put a limit on how many Italians right. could come in 1924. Am I right about that? Yes. Yeah. It was some sort of act that was passed. But he somehow got in and left my grandmother with my aunt and uncle, who were small children. And he said to her, You have to take care of my parents until they die. And then you can come over with the children. And that's exactly, I, and I thought, is that like an Italian thing? You know, uh, so his parents were very elderly. And so she had to raise two kids on her own in Italy and take care of her in-laws. And then by 1928, I guess they had both passed and she came over, no English, with a seven-year-old and a three-year-old by themselves. Uh, yeah, and, and, I, and I have kind of a reverse story of that. When, when my mom's parents came over from, from uh, Torito, Bari, uh, they left their eldest son, uh, my uncle John, in the care of his grandparents. He was only about two or three years old. And I think the intent was they were gonna go back one day, uh, but they started having children here and then they, they didn't. And as a result, um, my uncle didn't come until through Canada, uh, he went to Canada in 1949 and didn't get to the States until like 1954 with his whole family. Oh, wow. And, and he had never, uh, when he got to Canada, he, had, he hadn't seen his parents in like 35 years and had never met his brothers and sisters. Wow. Oh, that is interesting. Yeah. And, and, he, and, and he tells a story. He told the story to my cousin that when he got older, he didn't really want to come because his grandparents was the only family that he knew. Um, so he's two or three years old. Does he was he even aware of his parents at that point? Well, he, he knew because they used to send money and stuff like that. I see. Um, so he knew that his parents were here and he knew that he was having brothers and sisters. But, you know, he, he then got married and started raising his family. And, and that was that. How did he come over? Did he come over by himself? He came by himself on a and steamer. How old was he? How old he, was he? Well, when he came, he was probably... Oh, 40 ish in his forties in his early. 40s. Oh, 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 yeah. oh. Yeah. No, when he came, when he did finally come, he was in his forties. So his whole family, he got married there. 
All my cousins were born there. That is wild. Yeah, yeah. Is he alive? Uh, no, he passed away uh, oh many many years ago. Uh, my my mom's family was was probably a generation and a half or so, or you know, uh, behind yours, you know, or in front of yours. So yeah, uh, he was born I think in probably around 1906 or something like that. Um, so so let me get this straight. So he comes here at 40, and he's got siblings who are American. Mm-hmm. And he's coming over this and he said, so he had the Italian accent and everything and his sisters and yeah. brothers had like- American accent. Right. That, that <laughs> reminds me- yeah, And that he, rem- couldn't, he couldn't come straight in. He had to come because uh, there was so many Italians coming after the war. Uh, right. He had to go, he spent five, five years, I think, in, um, in Canada with his whole family. <laughs> and even though his, his I mean, my, my grandparents had um, five sons in the war at one time in World War II. And even with that, he still had, he still couldn't come right in, you know, after the war. So. Oh, man. Oh, forget my story. Let's talk about yours. <laughs> no, no, yours is extremely interesting. Um, so, okay. So let's go back to Friuli. Um, yeah. And um, so, your, so your grandfather, uh, I, I read that he, um, he eventually went to, to Austria, I think, to learn the trade. Yeah, he did. And it, and it's all, it's all in out of Rushmore shadow. I'm sorry. I'm trying to get it out of the glare. This is the book. It's called out of Rushmore shadow. And in the book, I talk about how my grandfather was living in, um, literally called Borgo del Bianco. And it's still there. Borgo del Bianco. It's a little burg outside of a town called Meduno in a province called Pordenone in Friuli, which is way Northeast, like I said, border Slovenia and Austria. Mm-hmm. And he carved a little, the, the legend has it, he carved a little dog out of wood. And my great grandfather Vincenzo said, you have talent. Uh, my grandfather did come from a long line of wood carvers, a lot of craftsmen, skilled people uh, in Friuli. In fact, if you look at um, a lot of the tile work on the subways of New York, a lot of that were done by Fulan people. Uh, Little really? Friuli was like East 34th Street and 2nd Avenue. Yeah, it was big. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. I didn't know that. Um, and uh, all of that terrazzo on marble floors. I don't know if you're familiar with terrazzo. Yeah, sure. Floors. Yeah, yeah. It's all done by my grandfather's people. Right. That, and that's all over New York City. It's all over New York, out in, in and around New York. I mean, I went to my high school not that long ago and I'm walking along the floor and I'm like, how many times did I walk on these floors? And I had no idea of the connection to Friuli. Mm a lot of people on these terrazzo floors. So, uh, so he, the nearest carving school is not in Italy, it's in Austria. So he goes to Austria and uh, I, have a, I actually have a program that I do uh, where I use a, a PowerPoint to show incredible photos. Uh, and there, of course, there, these photos are all in the book of my grandfather um, as a 13 year old carving in Austria. Mm, wow. And his diploma is all in German, you know. Um, and then he studies there for three years. And then in 1908, he, then he studies in Vienna and then in Venice. And by 1910, he decides to come here. He's 18. And he writes to our relatives in Barry, Vermont to sponsor him. Because there's a big stone quarry there. And there are some Del Biancos that are, that are stone carvers. And so he comes over on the uh, Dante Alighieri and goes to Ellis Island and settles in Barry, Vermont. And so, he so there as a memorial stone carver. Right. So he had family here already. Yeah, moment. he had a cousin Pietro, and uh, some some a couple of genealogists helped me uh, dig up some information. Um, I think I might have been on ellisisland.com. I'm not sure. When my grandfather first comes here, he doesn't have the fifty dollars necessary to be put through. Apparently, you had to have minimum fifty dollars in your pocket cash. He had like they had twenty five, so they had to bring his cousin over to pay for the rest to get him into America. <laughs> so they had literally detained him for like three days. Yeah, he was detained. He wasn't a prisoner, so to speak, but he was detained. He was still undocumented, and he couldn't really go anywhere until he got that extra twenty five dollars. Um, and so he goes with Pietro. Um, not really sure whether they go right to uh, Bari. I'm, I'm assuming they do. 
And then, uh, yeah, he lives there for um, a few years. And then World War I breaks out and he gets back on a boat and he goes back and fights for Italy. Wow. And I think That's a lot awesome. of, apparently a lot of immigrants did that. Um, he was still, you know, he was still loyal to his country. So he fights for Italy and he's a sergeant. And uh, then after the war, not sure what he did between 1918 and 1920. Maybe he studied more, maybe he tried to find work, but he comes back to Bari in 1920. And he meets another stone carver and the stone carver's name is Alfonso Scaffa. And Scaffa says, you have talent. I work for the great sculptor Gutson Borglum, who has mm -hmm. a studio in Stamford, Connecticut. I want you to meet him. So he brings Luigi to meet Borglum in Stamford, Connecticut. And Borglum is just blown away with my grandfather's ability. And he says, I want you to quit your job in Bari, Vermont, live on my estate so you could work in the studio with me every day and you will be my expert in granite and marble. And uh, Luigi is not gonna pass up this opportunity to work for a world renowned sculptor. So he, uh, in the meantime, Alfonso who lives in Port Chester, which is like 15 minutes South from Stanford, um, says, I want you to come and meet my family. So he brings Luigi down there and he introduces him to his sister-in-law, who's this little beauty from a brood cell named Nicoletta Cartarelli. My grandfather falls in love, you know, she returns in kind. And so Alfonso Scaffa not only introduces Luigi to Guts and Borglum, but to my grandmother. And that's why I'm here. So wow. Luigi <laughs> ends up living on Borglum's estate with my grandmother their, for their first year of their marriage. And then he ends up settling in Port Chester. And that's where the, why the Del Biancos are all, all from Port Chester in, in this part of New York. Uh, yeah, that's 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 neat. And and I didn't realize that Borglum that he did uh, Stone Mountain. He did. He did do Stone Mar Mountain. Um, in fact, my grandfather was his chief carver at the beginning of that project. Borglum never completed it. In fact, he just started. It's a really kind of a complicated story. And it's one of the reasons why he has a reputation of being a white supremacist because people um, thought he was a member of the KKK. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, um, long story short, uh, the daughters of the Confederacy approached Borglum about creating a bas relief of the leaders of the Confederacy on the side of this mountain. And this had never been done before. And Borglum was all about that kind of like, I'm going to do something bigger, bolder, you know, never been mm -hmm. done before. So he takes the project on. But he doesn't realize that the silent partners of the, um, well, I don't know how silent they were, but the, the daughters of the Confederacy were also being funded by the KKK. So Borglum um, decides that he... Uh, has to, I guess has to, you know, kind of rub shoulders with the KKK because they're paying him to do this work. So I don't know if he became a card carrying member, but obviously he has his association with them. But the KKK starts making more demands. They want a tableau added to the Confederacy statues of a slave on his knees, thanking his master for giving him a good life. Can you imagine? And Borglum, I don't know, Borglum, whether he doesn't want to do that for artistic reasons um, or whether he uh, is morally against that. I don't know. But he he smashes the models. He says, I'm not doing this project. I'm out of here. And uh, the, the KKK sends the police after him and he's on a high speed chase in the middle of the night. With the little sun. Wow. I don't know if Luigi was with him because he had Luigi down there uh, working with him. My grandfather never talked about it. And he leaves Georgia and Don Robinson, the state historian who's looking to create something to attack tourism in South Dakota reads about the story. And he says, this is the kind of guy I need to do my mountain sculpture. And that's how he finds out about Borglum and eventually hires Borglum to do Mount Rushmore. Uh, yeah, and you know, you know, you could think about these things and I would have to think based on, you know, Mount Rushmore and what he want, what he did there is that uh, you would have to think that he was probably against this whole thing and, and maybe maybe he didn't realize what he was getting himself into when he hooked up with the KKK guys. You know? Yeah, yeah, and Borglum was all about control. He did not want to be told. He did not want to be told what to do. He was a, a yeah, yeah. I, I think it's safe to say he was an egomaniac. He probably would admit it. Maybe it takes an egomaniac to do what Borglum did. You know, I was going to say that. Yeah. How do you do that Mount Rushmore unless you're in uh, unbelievable. <laughs> you have to be unbelievable with all the problems he had to deal with. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so um, now that he, when, when Mount Rushmore was first started, was your grandfather involved from the outset or, or he brought him in later on? A good question. Uh, Mount Rushmore started in 1927 and it moved very slowly. The carving moved very slowly. And by 1933, the head of Washington was about three quarters of the way done. And Borglum realized um, you know, that most of the men working on the mountain were unemployed miners that had no work during the depression. And he hired them because the, um, the money coming in from the government was now coming in during the depression and funding was really limited and Borglum had a, Borglum had a really hard time getting classically trained stone carvers because number one, he needed somebody, people that were physically strong because this was really demanding yeah. work. Two, you couldn't be afraid of heights. And three, you had to be able to carve on such a grand scale and to be able to adapt the perspective. You know, imagine carving and finishing eyes and making sure that from a thousand feet away, 5,000 feet away, that it looks you know, mm -hmm. real convincing yeah. and you're, you're, you have no sense of, you know, you're carving a bust. You could carve, you could step away three feet, but how do you step away a mile every time you carve? And, and so he needed somebody with that ability and he didn't have any trained hands to do that. And my grandfather had already been working for Borglum all throughout the twenties. And that's when he realized I need, I need somebody with uh, Luigi's ability. Um, so he hires him in 33 to be the chief carver. And that's when my grandfather starts. Uh, he's, he's directing the carving. He's training a lot of these men. Uh, in the book, um, I, I share my grandfather's immigrant experience and I also follow his experience at Rushmore. And, but the book ends with the fact that, you know, my uncle discovers that my grandfather uh, was uh, not mentioned in the most definitive book on Rushmore. And that's when my, my uncle and I start researching. We find hordes of incredible documentation from the Library of Congress where when my grandfather's first hired in 1933, the Mount Rushmore Commission does not want him. They object to him and they won't pay him what he deserves. And my grandfather quits several times throughout the work because of problems with money. Borglum uses the word sabotage. I mean, it's really dramatic stuff and it's all in the book and how my Borglum literally has to pay part of my grandfather's salary out of his own pocket to keep him because he is literally the only one who is capable of refining the faces. I'm, carving is one thing, but refining is the icing on the cake. And that's what gives the, gives the faces their humanity. And so the book really goes into detail about my grandfather's story of an Italian immigrant who faces discrimination and sabotage while being the chief carver on Mount Rushmore and how the designer does everything he could to keep him. In fact, my grandfather, doesn't work at Rushmore the last two or three years of the project. He refuses to come back. And we'll never know exactly why because Borglum doesn't get into detail about it. My grandfather was probably too proud, but I have an incredible letter from 1940 where Borglum says, I need to finish the faces by the 1st of July and all of them, I need you. So my grandfather's literally the only guy on Rushmore because there's nobody else that could do what he is, his special talent is and that is refining these faces. And that's something that Rushmore has not acknowledged, uh, had not acknowledged until 2017. I know, and, and that's and that's shocking. And uh, and you know, I know you mentioned the, the finances a little bit. We aren't talking big bucks here either. <laughs> yeah, well, it took a million dollars to do the whole thing, and that's something like I don't know what that would translate to today. But a million dollars was, uh, you know, over a 14-year period. Right, and what your grandfather was getting paid was not you know, this incredible sum of money. <laughs> no, it was $1.50 and his highest pay was $1.50. But my father always said, you know, that was really good pay for the depression, you know, $1.50 an yeah. hour. He says, mm -hmm. And he says, there was a time when my family, we were eating roast beef and potatoes when everybody else was eating lentil soup during the depression. So there was, the, when my grandfather was working at Mount Rushmore, the family was pretty comfortable con compared to everybody else during the depression. Uh, and, you know, and I know you, I know you mentioned it in the book, uh, where they're going back and forth. And some of the more famous books uh, do not mention your grandfather. Um, did, were you able to find out why that is, that this great Italian-American 
wasn't mentioned in this whole project? Well, there are there are there are a couple of books that do mention him. Uh, Gilbert Fight uh, mentions him once and says that he was one of the most competent men to ever work on the mountain, and that when he was hired in 1933, it was considered a banner year. Like a lot got done because he was there, because he had these this trained artist who can direct the men and train them and refine. Uh, and Judith Ch St. George wrote a young reader's book and she mentioned him quite a bit. Um, but the book that Rushmore files really love and rely on is The Carving of Mount Rushmore by Rex Allen Smith. That is still considered the definitive uh, book on the carving of Mount Rushmore. And that was written in 1985. And my grandfather is not even mentioned. And my, my uncle Caesar, I remember him slamming the table and saying, that's like talking about the Yankees and not mentioning DiMaggio. <laughs> and I thought that was a great, great analogy. And so uh, I had such a great connection to my grandfather as when I was a very little boy, because I remember him saying to me, I am Luigi, you are Luigi. Mm -hmm. And I felt like there was, he was charging me with something. I didn't know at the time what it was, but Caesar and I got together and we decided to research my grand finally researched my grandfather's importance because we knew he was the chief carver. We knew that he was important. Why is he not mentioned in this book? And so when I was able to unravel all of this confusion about um, Rushmore's stance on my grandfather, which was basically, he was a worker and we, 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 we recognize everyone equally as a group. I mean, when I first went to Mount Rushmore, I said, is there a plaque dedicated to the chief carver? I mean, he was, very important, you know, the, the, fine, the refinement of expression. And they showed me a plaque of 400 names of everybody wow. that worked on it. Wow. From labor, nothing against a laborer, you know, uh, secretaries, drillers, and then the guy who put the soul into the faces. So I thought this is like taking Clark Gable out of um, uh, the leave oh. role and gone with the win and making him an extra. It just makes yeah. no sense. He deserved, yeah. he did, he's a singular person on that work. So, um, when I, read, when I read Rex Allen Smith's book, it became very clear to me what his, the hook of his book was. And that was, wow, Guts and Borglum hired 400 unemployed miners and look what they were able to accomplish. These roughneck, rowdy kind of, you know, roughneck guys. And it's a, actually a great story when you think about it, you know, but it's not completely true. I mean, the, yes, these men were amazing. A lot of them were trained on the job and a lot of them became very proficient at transferring the measurements and blocking out the faces. But Rex Allen Smith obviously intentionally left out my grandfather because my grandfather would have disturbed that narrative. It would have, it would have blown his book out of the water. It'd be like, oh, okay, I don't want anybody to know that there was this ringer who refined <laughs> the faces and trained a yeah. lot of guys. Right. So, and Mount Rushmore really embraced that narrative of Brex Allen Smith's book. So they raised money and they created the um, Lincoln Borglum Museum in uh, the visitor center. And it was all about the workers, all about the workers. So it became like their brand. And so when the Del Bianco family comes along in 1991 saying, um, we have documentation that says that Luis Del Bianco is not only the chief carver, but he was vital to the work and that he needs to be uh, recognized separate from the workers. They, they, they didn't like that. They still don't like it, Bob. They still don't like it. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm Even though he's sure. been recognized, they were forced to accept um, his recognition. Yeah, and so to that point, I mean, this this was a monumental task of detective work from, from what I've read in the book. Uh, and not only the documents, but the photos. How did you, you know, for anybody else out there as you know, maybe your grandfather didn't carve Mount Rushmore, but they're doing research on their family. How did you find this wealth of knowledge, especially the photos? A lot of the photos I already had uh, from our family collection. We're fortunate that my grandfather uh, had his own camera for years. And um, he took a lot of these photos. So a lot of the photos are from the family collection. So when the book came out, people, most people, even people who are Mount Rushmore, whatever aficionados yes. had never seen these photos before. Oh, that's even better. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. And how about so, the documentation? The documentation. Uh, when I first went to Mount Rushmore in 1988, I talked to a gentleman named Howard Schaff, who was a local historian out there. And he actually wrote a biography of Borgman. 
also doesn't mention my grandfather. <laughs> but he said, your grandfather's story did not figure into whatever tact I took when I told Borgham's story. And I thought, okay, I, I didn't buy that, but I, but I respected the fact that he was being honest with me. And I said, how can I find out about what my grandfather did? And he suggested going to the Library of Congress to, to research the Borgham papers. You would think that all of these papers would have been in Mount Rushmore, but the Borglum family ended up sending them to Washington. So we spent six trips there, five, six trips, my uncle Cesar and I. He insisted on doing the research. He wanted to do it himself. And we found uh, this wealth of information. All of these documents are in the, in the book. Borglum talks about how he hires Luigi and um, uh, Mount Rush, the commission doesn't want him. And um, by 1938, my grandfather refuses to return and Borglum says he's worth more than any three men in America for this particular type of work. And that uh, every time he leaves, uh, all finishing on the heads has to stop. And that he will not let the untrained hands near the eyes, nose and mouth in terms of the refining. So it's very clear from Borglum's words that not only is Luigi important, but he's a singular talent that is necessary for the finishing of the faces. And that's why he woos my grandfather back in 1940 to, to single-handedly finish, finish, finish the faces, literally. I mean, it's in writing. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, just looking at the, 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 the photo behind you, you could see, even in, in that picture, you could see the eyes. You know, you could see the intensity yeah. in the eyes of, of, of everybody. Um, so I want to ask you about two things since we have the photo behind you. Uh, Jefferson wasn't supposed to be where he is today, right? And also right. there was a big uh, crack or something in his nose, yeah? There's a crack in Jefferson's lip. His lip. Uh, and uh, that was also something my uh, Borglum wanted my grandfather to address when he came in 1940. Uh, a lot of the, um, when Borglum picked Mount Rushmore to be the mountain to be carved, um, because he chose everything. He decided the presidents, he decided, you know, what it was going to look like, the model. I mean, he wanted a total control. And, you know, I think that's safe to say he deserved that, uh, being the mastermind. And geologists had to study the mountain to make sure that it was carvable and Borglum, and they said it wasn't. They said there was there were too much pegmatite stone, too much, mm. too many crystals, and you can't yeah. carve stone with crystals inside. Borglum just wanted this to be the mountain because he loved how much eastern exposure of the sun uh, the mountain was getting, and he that thought that would create incredible chiaroscuro, you know, the play of light and shadow. You could even look at the photo in back. I mean, look at the shadows on Washington's yeah. face yeah. and how dramatic that is. Borglum wanted that. He thought it was a natural marriage of, of light and shadow on the stone. So he somehow suppressed those documents and he paid dearly for it. I mean, this, this, this project was supposed to take four seasons, four six month seasons, a face per season. But they ran into so many problems with pegmatite stone. They had to change the models like 13 times. He, the, 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 the presidents were supposed to be full length or at least their bodies. The original model oh, shows their bodies that. as well. So they had to abandon that because of the stone. And originally Jefferson was supposed to be the first face and they had to blow it up and put him on the other side. And you can't really see Teddy, but you could see Teddy's kind of looks like he's uh, stuck back yeah. in the corner. They had to move everything over. And you couldn't really carve on the right, the left side of Lincoln. So, you know, these are sacrifices that, and, and concessions that they had to make. And, um, and, and Jefferson had a lot of uh, weird veins and pegmatite stone near his mouth. So Luigi literally had to do plastic surgery on Thomas Jefferson. He had to take <laughs> that bad crack out. He had to put in a new piece with steel pins and finish it. And it's the only repair, repair job done on Rushmore. And um, I'll never forget when I was there in 1988 and I was with a tour and the tour guy said, He's talking about the lip and he's saying, and that was the only repair job done on Rushmore and you can't even detect that the crack was there. And I just jumped up and down and said, that was my grandfather. That was my grandfather. I was so excited. <laughs> and the tour guide looked at me like I was crazy because at that point, Luigi Del Bianco, he was just a name on a plaque of 400 names. And, um, but I couldn't contain myself. I was like, cause I, this I was the truth. You. And that's when I realized this is ridiculous. This, 
he has to be known here beyond just a name on a, a 400 names on a plaque. It's ridiculous. No, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I, I could, I could see that. Um, you know, um, I could see the passion in able to, being able to do that. You know, um, I mean, I'm going through my, my um, uh, paternal grandmother comes from nobility, and and you know, in nobility, I'm, yeah, and you know, I'm trying to put together a, a book on that and reading some of the stories of some of these ancestors. To your point, you know, I've, I've researched them along in, in, you know, Botanica and various things on the web until I came across uh, the Tricani Italia, which is, you know, an Italian dictionary. And they have stories about these people that you can't find anyplace else. And, and I had no idea what these people did, you know, who was, who was poisoning who and who was murdering who and who was doing this to, to whatever person. Um, and I did. I've not been able to find a book about Italian nobility. You know, you have the Spanish, you have the French, but they're kind of unsung, if you will. Right. Uh, and they have a fascinating story, you know? And uh, my ninth great grandfather, for example, he pretty much owned or ruled all of what's Campania today. Oh, really? Yeah. And nobody oh, wow. knows that, you know? So, so I, could, I could see where you're coming from uh, with the passion and wanting to get this story out there. And it's, well, I mean, Mount Rushmore is such an important part of American history that why shouldn't he be known, you know? Yes, absolutely. So, so, so but I do have to ask you now, right? Uh, because my dad was a daily news photographer with the, with the speed graphic and all of that kind of stuff, you know? Uh, and I have absolutely zero photography ability uh, are you able to carve anything? <laughs> Am I able? I'm a little like carpentry. Well, that's better than Andy. I've never really had the uh, desire the to desire. explore that. I think if I had some serious talent, I, I have this theory that if you really have a, a, a talent that uh, you will have a natural curiosity to explore yeah. that. Now. And, you, and you, have have to, yeah, you have to have the eye. I mean, you know, my, my brother... You could, you could stick, I mean, if I sent him that picture of Mount Rushmore behind you and asked him, John, hey, could you sketch that for me? He'd sketch that out and it would look beautiful. Oh, wow, okay. I, and I can't draw a straight line. <laughs> it's amazing how genetics work. I mean, I, I have ability as an actor and as a singer and as a storyteller. Um, so maybe somehow some of his talent filtered down that way. Uh, but uh, nobody in my family, other than my uncle Silvio, had my grandfather's ability. My uncle Silvio definitely had some ability, but he didn't pursue it. He probably was uh, probably very intimidated by his father's great talent. There's, there's no yeah. doubt my grandfather had great talent as, as a family. Well, father. there's no question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, no, to your point, it's funny how that works. I mean, I I never really had the desire to do the photography. My brother did a, a, you know, a little bit. Uh, and one of my cousins was also a daily news photographer. So um you know it's it's and he and he got the desire because because of my dad you know he was like i don't know 10 or 15 years younger than my dad um but yeah i know it's funny how that you know picks up and sometimes it skips a generation you know um yeah sure so so now i also read in the book and i think this is this is a, a fun story um you weren't supposed to be named uh, lou or luigi right no, my mother wanted to name me Mark. And <laughs> my grandfather was in Italy at the time. He went back to Italy. He went back to Friuli quite a bit. And one of the reasons he went there was because uh, he had developed silicosis, which is a terrible lung disease that stone carvers and people working with stone got. And this is before, you know, regulations were put in to, to force people to wear masks. Mm -hmm. And so his lungs were just filled with filled with uh, silica from the, from the granite dust. So sure. he'd go to Friuli and the mountain air made it easier for him to breathe. So he would spend months there. So he was in Italy when I was born and he sent a telegram saying, you must name him Luigi. And my mother was like, this is America. We're not naming him Luigi. And he said, uh, name him Luigi and I'll give you a thousand dollars. And my mother said, give us 500 and we'll name him Louis. <laughs> 
but to friends and family, I've always been known as Luigi, you know, just, you know, but, but my birth certificate says Louis, but it was obviously connected to my, to uh, my grandfather. Yeah. Well, my grandfather was Luigi. So we got several Luigi's in the family because they, they had, they had nine children. So we, it's this Luigi and that Luigi and the other Luigi, but my brother, my brother was supposed to be Ubaldo. You, what is that name? Ubaldo, U-B-A-L-D-O. Does that translate into English into something? No. <laughs> Ubaldo. I've Ubaldo. heard of Ubaldo. I've heard of Osvaldo, but Ubaldo? Ubaldo, yeah. It's oh, a cool name. Very Italian name. Yeah. And, um, my, you know, almost the, the same thing. It, my grandma, uh, my mother told my grandfather, uh, and this was my father's father. Well, you know, there is a Ubaldo in the family. My oldest aunt named her second son Ubaldo in the tradition. And he said, yes, but he's not Ubaldo Sorrentino. And my mother said, you know, we love you and everything, but I, this is America. I can't name my son Ubaldo. <laughs> so he's John. Like, he's John. <laughs> that's kind of uh, the way my mother felt. I, she just felt like, you know, um, you know, Luigi is just too, too Italian for, 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 I don't know, for a second generation uh, kid. Uh, uh, but whatever they compromised and and know. yeah well you know luigi always it would be lou anyway i have a friend of who's course. i have a friend who's a, a, a italian and uh and uh he's lou i know lots of lou but for some reason i always whenever i text him i say hey luigi you know well then that's what happens to me obviously <laughs> you know especially among other fellow italian americans they call me hey luigi you know yeah yeah that's what my cousin my cousin that came from italy it was that was what we used to call him luigi luigi um, in fact, my nickname I, in the family is Ouija. Really? Yeah. Short for Luigi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> is that maybe that's because that's the way you used to say your name when you were young or something like that? Maybe. <laughs> you never know. You never know. My my cousin Joe, who grew up in Body and came when he was, I guess, maybe ten or something like that. Uh, and I forget he told my son because my son wanted to know. He's 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 uh, Giuseppe, but he was. We always called him Panuch. Growing up, Panuch. Panuch. Does that mean anything? It was. He explained it. I think it was uh, like a diminutive of Giuseppe. So you know, over in body because by I don't know if you're familiar with body, the body's language. It's, no. it's it's like you know, uh, it's probably one of the worst dialects in Italy. Oh, is everything, it really? <laughs> everything is everything is chopped off. You know, um, so you know, Manicotti is Manigot. Uh, oh yeah, well that that I know that from uh, yeah. growing up in Porchester. Yeah, um, so a lot of Porchester is Calabrese, and um, yeah, so yeah, well, it's very Perzutes. right next to each other. Yeah, Perzutes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, all of that kind of stuff. So yeah, so I think he, that's the way he explained it. it was like sort of a dimin diminutive of, of uh, Giuseppe uh, right. over there. Um, and you know, it's funny when when my uncle, I guess probably in the late 60s, early 70s, he wanted to make a trip back to Bari and they grew up, they actually had a house, which was pretty impressive. Uh, he wanted to make a trip back and my aunt said, I'm not going back. There's no bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> they, I mean, in the 50s, I mean, literally they had two rooms. One room was a bedroom. The other room was the kid's room, the den, the family room, the kitchen. And the, you know, there was no bathroom. You know, bathroom was, uh, there was an outhouse. And like I said, that was in the night, that was, you know, late forties, early fifties, something like that. So completely different world, you know? No, no. Um, you, if you're using a bathroom and then you have to go to no bathroom, that's a, that's <laughs> and, a shift. And I'm that's sure they were going to stay at a hotel that had a bathroom, but she, she didn't uh, want to go back. She wanted no part of, of going oh, back. And, you know, um, that's, that's rough. Ironically, uh, in, in 1935, my, my grandfather really must have missed his, family because he would be away at Rushmore for like six months at a time, seven months. And my grandmother would be back in New York, you know, raising three boys. So he, they all lived at Rushmore. And yeah, I saw that. My yeah, grandfather. Yeah. And they had to use an outhouse. My grandmother was not happy. Yeah, I bet. So this was going on in the 1930s. They didn't have modern plumbing where they had to live. They had to use an outhouse. Yeah. Um, so I just, I just, uh, Came, now, now came have you gone? Home. Have you gone back to the town in Italy? Have you been there? Uh, I was. I've been to Friuli once. I went in 1986. My wife and I went to Italy. I went to Italy for the first time 
and I went started in Rome and worked my way up through Siena and Florence and uh, Venice and went to uh, Borgo del Bianco and it changed my life. It changed my life. I bet. Um, uh, way up in the Italian Alps and the Dolomites. And I'm, and i stupidly, I, I had a beard at the time and I was wearing like a camouflage, camouflage uh, tank top. I was tan. I, I kind of look like a terrorist to tell you the <laughs> truth. And there was some terrorism stuff going on at Rome at the time. The, the, the airport, the, the airport in Rome was really uh, secured with, with military people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, there's this little uh, little Italian lady in her garden with the, like, with the bumpine on her head. And uh, I just, just started talking to her. And it turned out to be my cousin, Gina Del Bianco. And she flipped out and she oh. invited my wife and I into the house. Um, if my wife hadn't have been with me, I don't think she would have invited me in because I didn't look very um, <laughs> accessible. Um, yeah, and I turned out she was, uh, she was the sister of uh, Emanuela Del Bianco, who was a cousin who came here and was very close with my family. So that was just amazing. And I'm looking at her face and I'm saying, oh, I see Uncle Caesar in her face. I see this one in her face. I see the Del Bianco. I see it, that, that, that bridge between America and Italy is in this woman's face. Unbelievable, unbelievable experience. Yeah, that's fantastic. I, we were there once 25 years ago uh, and you know, we went to Rome. Of course you have to go to Rome. Oh, and then we, we took the train to Naples to pick up a car to drive to Sorrento. And I didn't know back then that uh, both my father's families lived a half a mile from the train station. Um, and I didn't find out until probably six or seven years ago that I actually had second and uh, third and fourth cousins uh, in Italy from that family. And we were supposed to go last April. Um, and of course it got canceled. And so we're hoping, I don't know, still holding out hope we may be able to get there, you know, in September or October, but if not next year, for sure. Um, but I want to ask you one more question about uh, your grandfather. And for, I guess, many years or in between uh, doing Mount Rushmore, he actually was doing memorials in um, um, Port Chester, yeah? Yeah, yeah. And he started out in America as a memorial stone carver in Barrio Ramon. He must have carved so many headstones by hand. And of course, we have no way of tracing. I know, but you, you did have a couple of photos and the, yeah. the work is incredible. That work is incredible. And the self-portrait uh, that he did in marble, it's just, it just it's, blows you away. Yeah. In Port Chester, when he wasn't working on Rushmore, and then of course after Rushmore, he must have carved 500 by hand in our local cemetery. In fact, he's buried in that same cemetery. So he's surrounded by his own work. And I yeah. used to love when uh, old timers would come up to me and say, your grandfather, he carved Mount Rushmore, but he also carved my mother's headstone. <laughs> they were like so, so proud the guy that carved um, that was the chief carver on Mount Rushmore carved his mother's headstone. So he walked in both worlds. He was working for this world renowned sculptor and then he was, you know, earning his bread and butter. Yeah, sure. Of course. Yeah. Of course. And, and, and I and lied. Creating, yeah, creating beautiful work on a headstone. And I lied. I do have another question. I almost forgot. That's fine. That this is important. Uh, uh, Primo Canera. Yeah. I, you know, and you mentioned it in the book. Uh, Mighty Joe Young, and every time I watch that movie and I see that scene, it's a <laughs> that was like a, yeah, it's a tradition. That, <laughs> every Thanksgiving, we had to sit down and watch Cousin Primo. <laughs> yeah, Primo Canera and my grandfather were um, lived like two little villages over from each other. Primo Canera was from a place called Sagual's. Again, the names of these towns are no vowels at the end. The Frulan language they don't say vino, they say bin. Mm -hmm. When they say hello, they say Mandi. No idea why. It's a really, it's, it's, a, it's a written language. That you, if you tell a Frulan that they speak a dialect, they get really insulted. They're very proud people. But uh, Primo was much younger than my grandfather, but uh, the families were very close. And uh, when, my, when Primo first came to this country, my grandfather was the first one to greet him. Really? He was brought over, um, brought over to be a professional boxer. Yeah, right. Right. He was he was there to greet him, and he created an incredible mo of of, of of Primo's fist. Primo had the biggest fists in boxing because he was a six foot six, two hundred and seventy five pound giant, which back in the thirties 
was really big. I mean, today, not so much, but back then that was a really considered a giant. Uh, and yeah. So, yeah, our families are very, very well, well connected. You know, every time I see that scene. I know, <laughs> funny. <laughs> you can funny think of my scene. grandfather now. So. <laughs> you have to see Cousin Primo. I just, just, just that's, I watched the movie recently after having not seen it for years with my wife. And my wife was like, well, this is a really good movie. I said, yeah, no, it's a good movie. Yeah. Uh, and a fun movie, and a fun movie. And it's exactly, and you know that Harry von Hausen, I can't think of his name, who does the special effects. I mean, considering it's, you know, 1949, you know, I thought they, it's been pretty amazing what they were do to do to make that ape seem so believable. Yeah, and and right. you know, I have to, I haven't looked it up. I should, um, the the lead or the female lead, uh, I forget her first name. Terry, I think is it Terry Moore. Terry Moore, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if she had a sister, but there's an actress, Cleo Moore, uh, same spelling, the last name, and they do look similar. Uh, but my dad, uh, she made a lot of these gangster type B movies and my dad took a photo of her. I'll have to send her the picture of- uh, It's so funny you bring Cleo up Moore. Terry Moore because my sister and I, my oldest sister are both, we love movies, old movies. Yeah, and me we too. And we were just talking about Audie Murphy and. And she said, oh, Audie Murphy was married to Terry Moore. Do you remember Terry Moore? I'm like, who's that? She said, oh, she was in Mighty Joe Young. Yeah. Apparently they were married for just a year and it didn't, it didn't work out. It's just oh. funny, I, you know, just right. in the past day or so, Terry Moore comes up twice where I'd never heard her name before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but see, some of these things are oh, coincidences. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I mean, I, I knew, I knew the, the girl from Mighty Joe Young, but I, I didn't know her name was Terry Moore. Well, this has been fascinating. I really, really appreciate it. It's a great story that everybody needs to know about. And yes, good point. Uh, where can people find the book? Uh, Amazon.com, uh, barnesandnoble.com. Okay, and I think you also have a website, right? I have a website, luigimountrushmore.com. Just like one word, luigimountrushmore.com. Okay. Um, and you can... Uh, and also you can email me, you can email me from the website if you'd like an order form and you can get it from me directly and I could autograph it and put an inscription. So, oh, so three ways to get the book, uh, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, or through my uh, website, you could email me for a, an order form and it's out of Rushmore Shadow, the Luigi Del Bianco story. Uh, great, and we'll, I'll put all the links out there too so people can find it easily. Great. great. All right, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Stop the minute.